Hello, everybody. The Nameless Narcissist here once again. A simple man diagnosed with MPD, giving you guys the facts and narcissistic personality disorder and things going on in my head. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. But keep in mind, I'm no clinician. I can only speak my own experiences, the studies I read. But I do have a clinician here today, a professional, so you have to listen to me. <laughs> Would you uh, like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm Wendy Beharry, and I am a clinician, a consultant, an expert in narcissism, and the author of Disarming the Narcissist. It, uh, also, I have read her book a long time ago. I read her book. I highly recommend it to anybody, especially people who are, because like for someone like me, it's not super helpful for obvious reasons, right? But it's still a really good read and especially helpful for people who have loved ones and stuff like that uh, who are narcissistic. It actually probably um, is a little bit of a more mild digest for someone with issues of NPD. Because remember, I work primarily with narcissistic men and oh, really? for 30 years. I do see their partners, of course, and family members, but my practice has been mostly working with narcissistic men. And they do find the book, you know, unlike popular culture, um, a little bit more reasonable and meaningful in understanding what truly is meant by the term narcissism and how to understand their narrative in a way that is more, you know, it, it's just more accessible and, and not devaluing and demeaning and shame based. It can make it actual, it can lead to actually constructive growth instead of kind of feeding into our self-hate, more or less. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I, sorry, one second. I have a book over here that I wrote a bunch of questions on. Yeah, sure. But, but yeah, um, let's see. What are we? Oh, here we go. But yeah, um, I like to start this stuff out with, so yeah, what got, got you interested in treating narcissism or narcissism in general, stuff like that? You know, it was not a deliberate choice to make this my specialty. It really was something I kind of got fascinated by back in the 90s when I was finding myself being triggered, you know, when someone like this would walk into the room sure. with their narcissistic style, coping styles, behaviors, modes, and various degrees of, you know, intensity. I would find myself just being very triggered, you know, feeling very, um, altered almost like I was in a much younger state of myself and of course a much more threatened state as a result so I was making all the mistakes you know giving in agreeing avoiding just indulging as opposed yeah. to and and being in fact quite entertained and impressed with the intelligence the wittiness the achievements the accomplishments as opposed to really doing what I need to do yeah, to set, you know, to set limits, to meet needs, to heal wounds. I wasn't doing that because I was in a, what we call that kind of altered state of being in my own vulnerable child mode. Uh, and so that started it. I was fascinated. I was curious. I was already working with Dr. Jeffrey Young in schema therapy development. And we started working on a, an approach for working with NPD. Nice. Um, that actually leads me into a, another question. Uh, well, just I don't have it. I didn't have it written down. But what would you say about the narcissistic style that kind of brought out that um, those kind of coping mechanisms, like the, the younger self of you and yeah. stuff like that? Because in my relationships, I have a lot of issues with my partner's feeling. It's better nowadays, but especially in the past, where they do feel demeaned or replaceable, and it was very unconscious. I was like making people feel like that. Yeah, and it usually is because unlike, again, I'll go back to popular culture, you know, if you're talking about a psychopath, that's very different than talking about someone with issues of narcissism because a narcissist, as you know, doesn't typically aim. They don't aim to harm. They aim to preserve ego and will do that at any cost. And so that can land in ways that may be harmful. So the things that would trigger me in the beginning that I was curious about was that sense of... Um, you know, feeling criticized, feeling like it was a competition, feeling this challenge, being interrupted constantly when I was speaking, you know, the impulse control problems that sometimes get in the way, um, you know, all that, all that stimulation in the brain that just oh, has to keep coming out. So it, there were those types of patterns, you know, it was the devaluing of therapy because many of them were coming in involuntarily under the threat of losing something precious to them. That's why they came. So, you know, 
as I like to say, oh, happy day. You know, I have a narcissist in the treatment room who doesn't want to be there. Right. Um, so those were some of the ways. That's funny. Uh, I Like, it just reminded me how I got into therapy because I was literally doing it to <laughs> this girl I was trying to get with was upset with me. And I was like, look, I'm changing. I'm in therapy. And I think that's kind of funny. But um, oh, now, uh, oh, dang, I had a really good question. Ah, I always do ADHD. Was it, a, was it a good there? Can I ask you some questions too as we go? Oh, yeah, through? go ahead. Because I'm curious, you know, was it, what was the therapy experience like for you given that you were doing it under this kind of threat? So, because it was, so at first it was under, I guess it wasn't really a threat. I was going there willingly to try to convince her that I'm great, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look how healthy I am. I'm in therapy. <laughs> but, I, but basically at first, like very quickly after that, um, the stuff with that girl ended. So, and what, since I was still in therapy, I was like, I got a few more sessions at least, might as well see, go, keep going. I started talking about that relationship. And the biggest thing that I found was I was just able to vent. And, the, and you know, the therapist won't get at least as overwhelmed as like one of my friends would when I like rage out or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it took me, after that, it took me, because I told her, even at the beginning, I was like, you have to like stand up to me. I'll walk all over you if you do not like try to have like good boundaries. And I think that a big issue was that for the first like two years, I was just lying to her and she didn't pick up on the kind of narcissistic pattern I was expressing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause I wasn't like this, go into a room. It's like, I'm the best thing ever. Look, your books are all stupid. I was thinking it, <laughs> but I knew enough to be like, if I want people to like me, I have to be polite. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of go in with like a condescending attitude, but it wasn't so obviously narcissistic, especially since she wasn't very experienced and trained person I saw her at the time. That's a really good example too, because I think for anyone listening who, and any therapists who happen to listen to your program, which this could be helpful for a therapist to have a listen, it's, you know, there's many different faces and there are many different modes that might show up. So like you said, you might be thinking one thing, but what part, what mask do you wear in the moment? What's your goal? What are you trying to achieve? And, you know, narcissistic people tend to be incredibly good at paying attention and imitating and courting someone, winning their favor, right? It's all about winning their favor. While there's others who will show up in the, you know, I'm gonna mow you down in a minute. So, you know, just don't even try to act like an authority in my space. Yeah, and different version. You get the charmers, you know, who are just charming and highly complimentary to an extreme that makes you go, huh? You know, what is that? <laughs> it, it's so funny because I like because not, I have not been I was never actually called out as a narcissist before um, I was diagnosed. Mm. And I remember one of the impressions that I made on somebody was hilariously and almost kind of apt where it was a friend of a friend who I had just met and I was like doing my thing. They're like, oh, hi, who are you? Like, what do you do? Like, I literally have a line that I go up to new people with where I'm just in there blatantly in their face. I'm like, hi, I don't know you, I'm Jacob. In a way that's like kind of so over the top but they're usually charmed by it. Mm. And the impression that I left on this girl was kind of hilarious because she was like, is that guy a sociopath or a serial killer? I asked that to my friend. And at first I was like, oh, what do you mean? Yeah. And Apparently, she said, well, I've never met somebody so charming and attractive before. It felt like he actually was interested in what I had to say. Meanwhile, while she's talking, I'm like, I want to talk about myself. I want to talk about myself. Like, shut up, you're dumb. <laughs> the entire time. Waiting for that chance to just kind of move in, right? Exactly. Waiting for my chance to talk, for usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do think people, because I see people all the time, they're like, I can spot a narcissist in a second. I'm like, well, maybe some presentations, but... If it was my presentation and I was cognitively like trying to hide my grandiosity and arrogance and everything, I don't think that anybody would really be able to pick up on it unless they're like very, very experienced. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing that the question that comes up so often from members of my online community who are mm -hmm. people trying to figure out what to do in these relationships, you know, living with them, leaving them, loving them, wherever, whatever position they're in. The question is often, how did I miss it? Or did I, miss it? why did I ignore what I was sensing? Um, how did the narcissist pull it off to convince me that I was so interesting and, you know, so worthy of, of loving and saving and rescuing and, 
you know, the typical things that, you know, you're describing as, you know, part of the the mission for winning someone over, you know, and just knowing how to do that so well, it doesn't mean that there's no genuineness in there, right? Oh, yeah. There, I mean, there's definitely at least a level of it, even if... Yeah, yeah. Wait, I, I wouldn't date somebody just for supply, so to speak. I can go to a bar and get that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had a, that reminded me of a question I really, I thought of that I really like. What would you say um, in the treatment process, what would you say is the biggest challenge? And is there anything about it that you enjoy in terms of treating them? The biggest challenge is getting at vulnerability. I mean, I think in the, in the treatment room. So as a therapist, the most important mission and the hardest one is to connect with real vulnerability. Mm-hmm. That, that very young self who carries all the loneliness and the shame and the story the story of an evolution of these constructs that have become ways of coping with life. I mean, I prefer this so much more to the term narcissism. So when people come to see me, you know, they've done their research because you guys do your homework really well and they're prepared. You know, they're in some ways sometimes more well read than I am even on the latest subject on narcissism. And so they're putting me to the test. But they're also coming in waiting to hear me say so you have a narcissistic personality disorder and i say look we can look at the criteria and agree that you know you meet some of this criteria somewhere along the spectrum of intensity but let's talk about what it really means and we get right into you know once upon a time there was a little boy who learned right and he developed this way of dealing with the world to survive and this became kind of a blueprint for life and you know, the sad thing is that the very ways of survival that worked when he was little, because it was all he had, are not working now. They're working in some ways. I mean, it works for the surgeon who's very successful, the accountant, the Wall Street guy. You know, it works, but it doesn't work in relationships. Yes, yes. That's, yeah. you mentioned that was so funny because I remember when I started to get like an inkling of, I was like, I, like that might be something I struggle with. I wasn't sure, but I was like, almost trying to do, give like a little bit of vulnerability to give some insight into how I thought under like, see what's wrong with me, diagnose, tell me what's wrong with me, more or less. Yeah. Do you do you get a lot where you can where you like your clients will like maybe lie or um, expect you basically to kind of rip off the max, so, so to speak? Well, I think they're fearful of that. The fear is that yeah. I'm going to be able to kind of like laser beam my way into seeing behind those masks that and so you know they're working as hard to keep me you know to keep me kind of distracted entertained um by being defiantly detached you know i don't know what you're talking about why does the past matter why are we talking about the past what a waste of time emotions emotions don't pay the bills wendy you know emotions emotions what am i supposed to do with emo- you therapists all you talk about are emotions Right. I get that. Or or I get, you know, um, total, you know, detour into I was reading this interesting article in the New York Times today and I thought you would want to hear about this. No, Wendy, you really are going to want to hear it. Let me make my point. And on they go. Tick tock. Right. Nothing good is happening in the session. So it's it's a lot of that, you know, just and what I know is is there behind all that is just an immense fear of exposing shame of perhaps failing what if i fail therapy you know what if i can't do it or or a suspicion and a fear that they're just another in a whole string of people who are being used by therapists for these little experiments that really don't go anywhere don't lead to anything good in the end like i know an issue with my uh therapy um was this idea of like well one it always therapy always (laughs) It's weird. Therapy always felt like manipulation because it felt like they're trying to get me to a certain point mm-hmm. and that it's not being straightforward when even if, and like in reality, it's probably just asking questions or at least if that's what she claims. I don't know if I believe it, <laughs> but um, another big issue was um, feeling replaced. How me, me and myself feeling replaceable? I'm like, there's not a relationship here. I'm paying you to help me. Is that something That's a you classic like? line, you know, it's the classic line. It's it's almost diagnostic. And so, <laughs> you know, what I often say to that is, 
yeah, you pay me for a service because I'm trained as an expert in human behavior and I have a specialty in this particular zone. But caring is something a human feels or doesn't feel. And I might be a good performer, but I couldn't pull it off that long. And certainly not when you behave like that. So caring is free. It's like it's on the house if I'm feeling it. But when you talk to me like that, the caring yeah. eh, starts to dilute a little bit, which is what I imagine happens with people out there in the world. So it's mm -hmm. always about making this relationship be a bit of a, a representation of what's going on where it matters, you know, in relationships out there. But it's still a relationship between two humans. And so, and it is a manipulation. We're working really hard to try to reorganize the way you've latched on to your experiences as truths about yeah. how the world works, about who you are in the world, about what you have to do to prove yourself and to perform in order to matter. So we are trying to tweak those experiences to correct those distortions. Yeah, okay. So I knew it. It is manipulation. <laughs> of the best variety. <laughs> true, true. Hey, I mean, that's a whole thing in, that I always say is that, well, I feel like everything's manipulation, but I don't think manipulation has to inherently be bad. Exactly. It can be things. And then yeah. people are like, well, that's not manipulation. Then I'm like, eh, maybe not. But, but it makes sense. It makes sense that yeah. it would feel like a manipulation and there would be kind of a incredulity around caring because... Most of the narcissistic men I've treated, Jacob, and you can speak for yourself, have grown up not being able to really count on people to be there for them in a genuine way. It's usually with conditions and usually being used as someone's trophy child or top performer. You're the one who's going to save the family or, you know, give us a reason for being or carry on our legacy. Right. So there's reasons um, why that suspicion exists. It's honestly really funny when it, uh, on a topic of like love, I made a video basically saying, oh, if people don't need me, they're going to realize I'm worthless and then they're going to leave me. It's kind of an insight I kind of had. And somebody was like, well, what if they realize you're worthless and they still love you? And like my brain fucking short circuited. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? Like that doesn't make any sense. Because <laughs> like, the, the concepts of love and self-worth are so inherently tied in my head that even now it's hard for me to really like, you know, cognitively I kind of get it, but also I don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, someone who loves you may realize that you don't believe in your own self-worth or they may accept that, you know, you're a perfectly imperfect human like most humans are and that there are things that you can do that might be incredibly hurtful. You know, like I say, that you may be doing things that are incredibly hurtful and that's not okay, but it's really important to know that it's not intended to be hurtful, as I said earlier. So I don't think it's so much, I love you and I think you're worthless that I would, I would imagine someone saying, I would imagine they'd say, I know you think you're worthless. And I know that you have challenges and things that offend me, but you're still lovable in spite of that. Well, now I'm uncomfortable. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, I do have, uh, I had a really, oh God, I keep forgetting the, um, oh, um, the sensation that, that you just, I also need to ask questions about your book. I'm sorry, I get all over the place with these interviews okay. and quotes. All right. Um, okay. You mentioned when, like, um, so you were talking about some of the people who are in narcissistic relationships and how they felt like they, you know, missed the narcissism itself, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you t used two words I thought was really interesting about, like, how could I, basically they were saying, how could I have believed this is a person that was going to save or rescue me? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a common theme in these relationships that they feel like the narcissist in quotes is going to save them? And I guess save them what it, uh, it would be the follow-up question. Well, I think that, you know, people with issues of narcissism, which is the way I'd like to put it, um, are really good at detecting those where they can make a difference, right? They can make a difference in the life of that person. And the payment for that is great adulation and praise and love and devotion and loyalty and submission and all the things that people with issues of narcissism really enjoy in a partner. 
and some enjoy the competition too, if if that's the case. But they yeah, really are good at detecting someone who has a problem that they can solve. And so it feels at first like, oh God, this this guy is just like a total giver and a hero. He's my hero. And that's lovely, except that usually it's part of the performance. It's part of the, I'll show you how wonderful I am. And you're just going to like fall in love with me and think I am just, you know, the master of the universe. Which is nice <laughs> when that does happen. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, what was the other one? The, oh, um, this is a question I asked Ruth. And it mm -hmm. honest, because I feel like, and this is a question I feel would surprise most people is how, if you do end up telling a client that they are narcissistic and stuff like that, or that, or have problems, have problems with narcissism, as you put it, um, how surprised are they usually, or do they ever go into straight denial about it? Most of the time they go into denial about it. And, and what I'm more likely to hear is, um, it's my partner who's the narcissist. So the finger gets pointed at someone else. Or they'll say things like, um, they'll start getting defensive. And they mm -hmm. go into the nobody appreciates me. I'm the victim. I'm the one who does everything. And, you know, no good deed goes unpunished kind of thing. So it's a lot of martyrdom that might show up. In some cases, that's more covert narcissism, but it's still a form of narcissism. The more sure. grandiose narcissist is just likely to say, you sound like my wife. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, I think all you women are just so self-absorbed. You want to talk about narcissism. That's probably, you know, all of you. No offense, Wendy. Right. But, you know, and so there's <clears> a great big denial. Or they wear it kind of proudly, like, okay, so I'm a narcissist. But you know what that means? I'm smart. I'm high achieving, I've done well, um, I got an edge that has helped me to promote myself in ways like you couldn't even imagine here in your little therapy office. And I, that's what I get. So they'll sort of wear it like a badge. That, that's that's kind of why I like don't it. like the term. That's why I, I switch pretty quickly away from the pejorative, because the term is pejorative, let's face it, yeah. and go to what does it really mean? Let's really flesh it out and understand what does it mean? as opposed to just this big, fat, meaningless, or not meaningless, but a label that doesn't provide a whole lot of direction to a therapist. It, it means practically nothing in terms of um, what that label is actually conveying nowadays. Yeah, um, and there's so many forms. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Oh, yeah. I mean, hell, with any, I would say with any person I swear, the amount of presentations it can have yeah. to view it as so homogenous is, makes it almost worthless a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, I do think it's funny because, I don't know, when I first was diagnosed and doing a lot of research into narcissism, my first thought process, like, surface-level articles are like, oh, they're master manipulators and stuff like that. My reaction was, fuck yeah, I am. I'm so good at manipulating people and stuff like that. Weirdly enough, that's something that should have been a bad thing just fed my grandiosity, mm -hmm. which, I, which I always kind of touch on. So I'm always like, hmm, maybe that's part of the issue right there. We might lean into that stuff a little bit because of some of the cultural stuff around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, so let's ask some question about your book because I don't want to completely neglect that. So what would you say, what would you say your goal was in writing um, Disarmament of Narcissist? You know, I wrote the book back in 2007, the first edition. So it was a long time ago. I was invited to write this book after someone from the publishing house heard me give a presentation at a clinical conference. Oh. And they asked me to write the book and I thought, you know, this might be quite rewarding given that I was seeing a lot of clients at the time who were living with and loving the narcissist in their lives and feeling really foolish for doing so, but feeling rather stuck both with their their empathy and their love, but also other reasons that it wasn't so easy to create a departure plan from this relationship. So I wrote the book largely for that audience and also keeping in mind that perhaps some of my narcissistic clients, because again, I was working with a lot of narcissistic men, might find this book more easier on the digestion in appreciating their story. I'm a big believer, as you know, if, you, if you've if read anything or listened to anything I've ever said, you know, the word empathy and Wendy Beharry sit as closely as Wendy Beharry and narcissism. 
I'm a big believer that it is empathy that is the golden nugget. And so I talk a lot in the book about get to know what it means, understand every facet of what it means because it's the first ticket to freedom from personalization and self-blame and self-doubt. You know, when you're dealing with someone who's narcissistic, it's really easy to get caught in the web and not be able to kind of see yourself. So there's a liberation in knowledge, even for the narcissist themselves, even for someone like you who went through therapy, you know there, there's something very liberating about just making sense out of something. And that's empathy. It's not compassion. It's not sorrow. It's not making excuses and feeling sorry for the narcissist. It's just getting it, just the sensibility of it. So there's a lot of strategies of empathic confrontation, which is a schema therapy strategy, but also a specific one that I've elaborated for working with this population. I I love that a lot because I get like, you know, of oh, like, are you expecting us to feel sorry for narcissists? And I'm like, And like, it's always been a hard thing for me to kind of grapple with because I'm always like, well, I mean, I hate pity, but I guess we're kind of deserving of it sometimes. But I always kind of bring up my sister who is, who has borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Not a fun combo, by the way. And I I had like so much resentment about that Mm -hmm. uh, for so long because, you know, in my childhood, it, it wasn't pleasant growing up with. But then once I started to actually understand like, oh, this is a sick person who doesn't really know what they're doing and you know it's not about me more or less it became a lot easier to be able to grapple with it and i don't feel bad for my sister i'm like a lot of those choices are around it's kind of her fault but at the same time i can i guess empathize with her a little bit better and understand how the reality behind it yeah and the empathy allows us all of us as humans not just therapists it allows us to be able to say things like you know look i get it it's not your fault that you found yourself in this position, but it is your responsibility. If you want to make a difference, if you want to change it, that's up to you. And that's just kind of my line with that. that's used with great genuineness because it's just a fact, right? It's yeah. like we can feel sympathy and compassion for someone who was wounded as a child, who was helpless, who was powerless. You know, if, if I maybe if I saw your life on the movie screen and we were watching it together as a motion picture, we'd be just, you know, feeling so sad for a little boy who blah, 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 you know, whatever the story is, we'd be feeling a lot of sadness. We'd be rooting for him. We'd be cheering for him. We'd be understanding why maybe he had to put his head down and do everything to be the top performer, why he was the comedian, why he was the savior for his mother, whatever it might've been. We can see it, we get it. But then sadly, we see him continuing to use these methods into his adult life. And now we're not feeling the same sympathy, but we are empathic, meaning it makes sense, even though we don't like the fact that he's so mean to people or he's so disrespectful or he's so intrusive or whatever it might be, right? So there's just less tolerance in the world of the grown-up who can make a difference as opposed to the world of the child where, you know, the kids are pretty powerless. That's a really good way of putting it, my gosh. I am enjoying this a lot, by the way. I'm, I want to rewatch this. Yeah, like <laughs> everything you say is really insightful. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, okay, you uh, you touched on this in your book that I want to go into a little bit more detail to. But it's not a concept that I really saw. I really see brought up very often. But like you you say that there's like presentations and female and male um, present. Uh, presentation of narcissism yeah. and I would love for you to talk about that a little bit more because I never I don't hear about that very often but obviously there is some kind of differences yeah I mean some of the studies will show that you know the difference between grandiose narcissism and covert narcissism is you'll find more men in the grandiose version women in the covert that doesn't mean they're quiet necessarily it just means yeah. there's more dramatic presentation of emotionality it's not necessarily yeah. vulnerability but emotionality more super mm-hmm. sufferers as i call them the virtuous victims you know the you have no idea the pain i've suffered you couldn't possibly imagine so it's this sort of outstanding suffering and this martyr for the most part now there's men in that group too and there's certainly women you know we've got plenty of divas in the grandiose overt categories too yeah. So there's overlap, but I think more commonly what you'll find is women tend to fall into that more dramatic or histrionic presentation of narcissism where men tend to fall into that more 
you know, arrogant, performance oriented. I don't feel anything. <laughs> I'm just kind of an achievement oriented automaton. Get out of my way. Um, into that cat and and look at me in some cases too. Uh, I'm God. I'm just like I just had like a flashback of when I was like younger and how I would how like I literally viewed emotions as like beneath me almost. It's like oh, lesser people are ruled by emotions. I'm completely rational, which is ironic looking back on it. I'm very emotional. <laughs> Are you? But, you know that. Hmm? I mean, you've known you've known that. You figured that out. Yeah. It, when I had that realization, I was like, "Oh my god, wait!" <laughs> I'm like, if nothing else, anger is an emotion, right? Absolutely, it's the chief hmm. emotion when it comes to narcissism. It's the one that all of my clients would say, "I feel things. I feel angry." <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny nowadays i fucking hate anger like it's so exhausting and when it's like your default most of your life it, like, you don't the really... word. you just said the word exhausting and this is the problem when it comes to again popular culture you can tell i'm have a little bit of a problem with it when it comes to narcissism <laughs> popular culture says you know beat your chest be angry roar like a lion don't let them take advantage of you well you don't have to do all that to set yeah. limits and boundaries and protect yourself to have a sturdy voice to be a good self-advocate to, to to hold your values forth you don't have to be angry all the time to do that i mean anger is it's an important emotion because i think it usually is conveying i call it the siren you know, it's like a siren's loud and it's and somebody's in trouble. Somebody's hurting. So there's something else important happening underneath the anger. And that's what we try to get to in our investigation. And I prompt everyone to try to investigate what is the anger? What's going on? Some some part of you is hurting. Some part of you is scared. Some part of you is in trouble. Right. But anger all by itself, just to try to have this sense of bravado is it's wearying. It's wearying to the muscles, down to the bone, right? I, I imagine when you tell some narcissist that you're like, hey, like, look underneath. The, where, what, Where's that anger coming from? What's the emotion underneath that love? And they're like, there's nothing there. Bullshit. Yeah. And I say, well, you know, it's not bullshit because it's intense. You know, if you just yeah. said to me, I'm feeling a lot of anger inside. This is so frustrating for me. I'd say, okay, that makes sense. I feel that sometimes too. But when you become the anger, you become it, you know, there's something very intense that's been activated because now you're in a survival mode, right? You're trying to fight something. There's something you're trying to ward off. So, no, it's not bullshit. There's something you're feeling that's important. Now, the word is important. Is that a manipulation? You better believe it because, <laughs> because it gets their attention, wouldn't it? But it's also true. So it's not yeah. a manipulation based on a game or a trick or something deviant. It's based on truth. There is something more important hiding beneath the anger. That's why the anger is intense. Well, I do like that a lot. Um, out of curiosity, very, well, we don't have to stick on that top, this topic too long, but do you treat any other personality disorders? I have, sure. Yeah, I've been in practice for a really long time. So yeah, I guess it's impossible not to. I've right? had, you know, I've worked with borderline personality disorder in the past. Um, yeah, I've worked with avoidant personality disorders. Um, I don't, I've not treated, at least not successfully, obsessive compulsive types so well. But really? there is an OCD component in narcissism, which is a little different than OCPD, you know, the personality disorder type. And often it's it's that way of control and order and keeping my life, you know, kind of all stacked just right um, for that super autonomy that narcissists do tend to crave. But yeah, I've worked with lots of different, I mean, I work with a lot of couples and I, I, I've done a lot of other work, but my primary focus of the last 25 years has really been in working with issues of narcissism. It's because we're the most interesting, obviously. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, it's, it is funny, actually. Oh, I might actually, I would actually love to hear your opinion on this. Um, well, again, we don't have to say on it too much, but I see a lot of people who they describe their partner. And, so, and don't, I usually don't. I'm like, I'm not going to I can't fucking back your partner, like whatever. But they'll say some things and I'm like, whoa, that is not, and I won't tell them this usually. I'll tell them to go to therapy. And, but they'll be like, They'll describe it, 
and they'll be i'll be like whoa that's not and like very obvious ocpd traits or also mm-hmm. paranoid personality disorder traits yeah. because there's that control aspect in all three mm-hmm. um there's the obviously the paranoia in that uh and the perfectionism in mpd and ocpd and i would say like if you have you have like a silver bullet, so to speak, to differentiate between narcissism and other personality pathologies. What do you think is like the hallmark that differentiates them? Entitlement. I guess, entitlement, really. Yeah, I think it's the thing that differentiates. It's the one schema that we will not find in most other personality. Not not none, but in most others. There may be smaller fragments of it in some, or occasional signs of entitlement as a mode. But the differential in narcissism is that there's a degree of entitlement, like I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled to behave this way. I'm entitled to think this way. I'm entitled to act this way. You know, the old rules don't apply to me because because either I've suffered so much, I've worked harder than everybody else. I've been born into the blue blood. I've whatever it might be, you know, I've achieved, I've contributed. There's something, but I'm entitled. And we know the entitlement is a direct compensation for that deep shame and defectiveness underneath and that loneliness. But I think it's, that, a, it's a differentiating factor. That's 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 so interesting because I never heard, because I always say that to me, how I conceptualize it is the core of narcissism is like self-esteem regulation more or less. But here, but like the unique aspect of it being entitlement really kind of hit home just because I was like, that's the symptom I am the least aware of more or less. Like that shit slips by me all the time without realizing it because when you think of entitlement i'm thinking oh i go to the front of the line because i feel like i'm allowed to and i'm like no i wouldn't do that that's stupid and impolite nice. but the subtle ways it comes out is oh, it can come out in so many ways to yeah. exactly the example you just stated it might be the the guy who rushes to the front of the line and is like oh, i shouldn't have to wait uh and they actually do it <laughs> it's amazing yeah. to but the the versions of it are typically more subtle and and subtle but still very painful you know as in betrayal because again narcissists unfortunately can get into betrayal betraying behaviors and the difference between someone who is on the narcissism spectrum and someone who isn't when it comes to betrayal is a narcissist is looking at me going what's the big deal like what's the big deal you're overreacting. Yeah, like, you know, I, I so I did this. I mean, you know, it's a subtle form of I'm entitled to do this. I, I should be allowed to do this. This shouldn't, this should not matter because I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. Why does this matter? And it's a minimization and a lack of empathy for the experience of the other, which goes to that big question, which I'm sure is on your list of can a narcissist be empathic? And I'll let you answer for your own personal self, but my answer is, of course they can, but it's an underdeveloped capacity. They're so busy not knowing themselves. How could they know someone else? I mean, they have to first <laughs> yeah, yeah. get to know God. themselves and really make sense out of their own life. And then they can turn that to looking at another. Because if you don't mitigate the shame, there's no way one can look at the hurt that they've caused another person with all that shame you know, boiling up inside especially when looking at the hurt you cause the other person causes more shame. Exactly. It's like, uh, it's, some of that thing that you just said, I was like, whoa, I had some, I have video ideas now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, oh, there was one. ADHD brain, I hate it. And <laughs> sensation seeking. Uh, oh, so this is something I've, I regularly kind of ask um, some when I have professionals on the channel, which is as often as I like, but we're getting somewhere. Um, is the term, how do you feel about the uh, term narcissistic abuse? Narcissistic abuse? Yes. You know, it's interesting you ask, because just today someone was asking me to help them with a, a case of someone who suffered narcissistic abuse. But yeah. they were referring more to the abuse by a narcissistic parent. Now, maybe you are too, because um, I think it can be, you know, come in the form of being aligned with a partner with issues of narcissism, where yeah. you become sort of wedded to, you know, the trauma bond. All well, this, there's a lot of lingo out there. Um, uh, there's a lot of I... lingo, you know. But I mean, in simple terms, it's easy to become, as a child, certainly enmeshed in yeah. the trauma of one's life because again you're helpless and so the tendency to surrender and detach when when possible 
is high for kids. It's their way of coping. Um, I think that narcissistic abuse, when it comes from a narcissistic parent, is it can sprout a child who just does the mimicry thing and becomes narcissistic themselves or becomes the codependent, you know, the self-sacrificing, subjugated, enmeshed, low, undeveloped self, echoist, as Dr. Craig Malcolm will talk about, the one who's constantly fearful of acting like a narcissist, so they tend to ask for nothing. It can go either way, and I think some of that is determined by temperament and biology, you know, which direction they may go, or even just vicarious exposure to what their siblings are doing, you know, how, how other people are responding to the narcissist. It's in, I love when people like talk about like, because I hear so often, it's like, oh, like you can only be a narcissist, you have a narcissistic parent. And that's going to be almost a assumption that people have. Mm -hmm. um, but because like my, because I like, sometimes I feel almost invalidated because my dad is OCD and my mom has strong HPD traits, but not formally diagnosed. Mm -hmm. But you look at my entire extended family and my grandma was diagnosed with BPD. Um, both my grandpas have some strong narcissistic traits, but they're not armchair diagnosing. Like cluster B is all over my fucking family. But my sister, uh, BPD and uh, yeah, so it's, not it's not unusual yeah. because remember the origins of narcissism. What we typically see, I mean, we typically see one or one or two different possibilities, and one yeah. that you're describing very well, Jacob, and very typically is the child who was essentially used to soothe, support, help the parent who was impaired or the parent who was depressed, the parent who was suffering from their own personality issues or the parent who was just lonely. And that child is the chosen child who's going to, you know, act as kind of a surrogate for that parent. And at the same time, maybe be doing the, meeting the expectations of another parent who has very high expectations for the child. So it doesn't have to be a narcissistic parent to develop traits of narcissism or to develop NPD. Uh, uh, it's just being that kind of, that select superstar who carries all the burdens, you know, and has to forfeit their childhood pretty early on in life. I think, uh, I, I forget where I read this, but um, I was reading some book and they put it in a way that I really like, is that, of course, everybody can use narcissistic defenses. And sometimes that can, and if, and those defenses can be triggered by children and affect them in a way that will make them pathologically narcissistic and stuff like that too. Yeah. I think that we see a lot of narcissistic behaviors and try to slap the label narcissist on them when, you know, uh, people with HPD, they use a lot of narcissistic defenses. Um, and I'm especially bad at it because I look at one narcissistic thing somebody does. I'm like, oh, they're a narcissist projection boy. <laughs> right. So I don't do that anymore. Yeah, no, I, I actually do think from just lots of years of trying to understand the origins of my own clients that I think a narcissistic individual comes to the world as, you know, like everyone, like a helpless baby, but with a higher degree of sensitivity and maybe a higher degree of impulsivity. And that's, in their, that's kind of baked into their temperament. And so they meet an environment that is not equipped to be able to really embrace that sensitivity and care for that. I mean, it's worse than even just the average sensitive child. So now you have this hypersensitive child who really needs maybe some tenderness, some encouragement of expressing their feelings and they're getting the opposite or they're just getting a wall or they're getting disdain for that. And impulsivity that isn't, treated with good parenting, you know, healthy discipline, but instead with toxic shame and character assassination. And I think that's where, I don't know, it's just my sense. It's not proven. There's no, we don't have any absolute studies. We have some studies that have looked at connectivity in the brain through diffusion tensor imaging studies. And you can see that, you know, higher scores on narcissism also correlate with these very low scores on connectivity around confidence and self-concept. But there's no cause and effect study. So, you know, we can only speculate on what we've learned in the treatment room. Right. Ugh. God, I, and it's a shame that despite how sensationalized narcissism is, there's not enough research whatsoever out there on it. <laughs> no, and it's hard because the part of the problem is that therapists um, don't want to work with this particular population. They get too intimidated and they feel too inadequate 
So it triggers a lot of things, you know, which is why, you know, I, I'm often teaching the subject because therapists are feeling yeah. at a loss, you know, they really feel at a loss in it. So that's part of the problem. It's hard to do the research on therapy effectiveness and outcome studies when A, you may not have enough leverage to pull the narcissist into therapy and keep them there. And B, you need a therapist who's really sturdy and yeah. C, you need a treatment approach that has some science behind it. Oh, honestly. Interesting. Um, that, that actually brings up a good topic. How do you feel like the stigma around narcissism in the public eye and in um, clinical areas, how do you think that's affected the treatment of narcissism? And, and the treatment. I think, unfortunately, it has thickened the sense of despair and hopelessness with mm -hmm. some, and it's added a unfortunate confirmatory bias about the possibility for help and i love it when someone looks at me and says you can't help a narcissist and i'm saying you're looking at me i've worked with narcissistic men for 30 years and you're going to tell me that you can't make a... i'm telling you you can because i've seen it i've done not most of the time that's true sadly it's not most of the time yeah. but certainly some of the time and under certain conditions, yes. And it's really quite powerful mm. to be able to, to see someone be courageously face such hard realities in their life and really transform themselves in meaningful ways. Not completely. Nobody changes completely ever. But, you know, in at least meaningful ways. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it, so it, it supports a confirmatory bias around what's not possible. That's oh, the problem yeah. with all this stigma and commercialization of narcissism. It's it's so funny too, because like I'll get people on my channel all the whole time be like, oh, narcissists can't change. And I have this study that I always link that shows over a two-year treatment period, 53% uh like would go into remission. And then they'll just be like, that's lying. And I was like, what the fuck do you mean? <laughs> oh, it's so funny. But see, the really problem with that is, you know, when you say that to an audience who wants to, why would someone want to believe it's hopeless? Well, for a few reasons. I made the right decision getting the hell out, right? So you don't want to have to look back and go, oops, maybe it, there could have been a change. Or a therapist who thinks, you know, it's not me, now has to think, maybe it is a little bit me. Maybe I, I need to sharpen my skills. So it's a threat. It's a bit of a threat, you know, to hear that kind of positivity or plausibility around effective treatment for narcissism. Some folks just don't want to hear it. I think happily, yeah. most people do want to hear that. I, and I would say that and I do want to kind of build on that a little bit because I earnestly believe that when you're out, getting out of a relationship with a narcissist, that level of anger and even maybe even maybe even that denial about the prospect of them changing, I think that's a healthy step in grieving before you get into the parts of being able to empathize, empathize, empathize and really understand the disorder and everything. I don't think that's that... Very. No. Yeah, it's absolutely... Uh, you're, you're spot on. I mean, it's necessary. You, you know, you can think about your own work and your own journey. I don't know where you are in your journey. Maybe you'll tell me, but... I'll do that. <laughs> you can think about your own work. You know, I think that I, I'm often trying to um, e express this idea, you know, in training. And m most therapists are certainly familiar with supporting grieving and the art of grieving. But there's a whole process to opening that gateway to grief which is about experiencing life or re-experiencing life in the imagination as we do in schema therapy as it were you know through our imagination and then reimagining what it would be like to actually get what we needed and to feel yeah. that well there's a little bit of a relief in that but there's also grief in that because there's a stark realization of i never got that you know that's what i needed what if i had how different it might have been. That, that's actually an issue that I see a lot with, because I know a couple other, con like three other content creators who have um, NPD. And one of the big things I bring up with them a lot, or we bring up to each other a lot, is like, what if we were normal, quote unquote? What if we were never basically shackled by a condition that does, that did harm almost every aspect of our lives? What kind of people would we be like? Would we be happier? Would we? You know have families well i mean 
one of them does. But you know what I mean. <laughs> there is a and there's a grief there that unfortunately the two that I do talk to on the regular that they aren't willing to engage with that grief too uh, heavily as of right now. Yeah. And hell, I'm not even to the point that I feel like I can engage with that grief particularly well because I start thinking about it. I'm like, oh God, that, that was awful. I'll come back to that for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary thing. It's a scary yeah. thing. And the tendency is to want to avoid it at all costs until you see the costs of avoiding it, right? It's that mm -hmm. same old cost-benefit analysis. So I'm going to resist the temptation to make this a therapy session and just stay with your questions. <laughs> I don't know how I always accidentally, I always actually activate some part of therapist that, that are like, oh, let's try to dive into Jacob. A like bit. paying attention to how much you're fussing with your hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's constant like I know. We, I know. we joke about how it should be the 10th um diagnostic criteria <laughs> <laughs> but oh uh, yeah now i'm going to be self-conscious about playing with my hair the rest of the day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just cover my camera for the rest of this <laughs> um okay so um uh, a question i really do like is if you had like one piece of advice for narcissists and then separately for their um ex-partners or victims or whatever, yeah. what would those pieces of advice be? It would be similar to what I said about empathy. I mean, the piece of advice I, I often give to partners is, you know, learn as much as you can. Know what you can because you first really need to work on helping to heal yourself, to find your voice again, because many have lost their voice along the way. They've forfeited it, they've subjugated. So, or they've just been like steeped in anger which is yeah. not a voice, it's just noise. So, you know, find your voice, find your message, and then deliver it with conviction, you know, deliver it in a way that speaks with both a respect and a thoughtfulness for what matters to you, like a good advocate, without having to devalue the other. Now, to the narcissist, I could say the same, but that <laughs> that just takes a whole lot more work. It's not, it sounds yeah. good, but it's not so easy to employ. I mean, I will often say to the narcissist, you know, let's learn as much as we can about how yeah. you became you, because you weren't born yesterday or last week. You know, it's a long time ago, and you developed a, a navigational map for how to live in the world and how to know yourself, and I, and I think it needs some tweaking. Because yep. again, while you are a superstar, you know, on the trading floor, or you're a superstar in the surgical room, you're not someone who does such a great job when it comes to engaging in your relationships. And what I usually get back from that is, you know, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not very touchy feely, you know, and it's not really that important to me. And my answer is, of course it is, <laughs> you know, of course it is. You know, that's something you've just taught yourself to say and yeah. to want to believe because it feels less threatening. But yeah. you're a human. We're humans. You need connection. We all need connection. And you don't have to give up your edge, you know, your sharp edge for all your productivity, performance and achievement in order to have a more intimate life. So it's a lot of um, education in the beginning and yeah. identifying activating conditions. What are the conditions under which you know you go into one of those narcissistic modes, whether yeah. it's, I'll show you or it's the entitlement or it's the charming or it's the argumentative competitiveness or it's the I don't feel anything, you know, into the into the cave, the wall goes up. How, when do you notice you're doing that? Are you trying to impress? You're trying to win approval. What are the conditions for the activation of that mode? So it's a lot of sort of spotting and watching yourself. I like that. Um, do you, uh, so con ten tangentially related, I don't know why I'm struggling. I think I'm intimidated by you, honestly. I'm tripping over my words so much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay. like... It's a good time to dive into vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, um, do you find a lot that like a lot of ours, because like this was an issue with me growing up so often. The mantra in my life was, why did I do that? Like, I would literally do things and I would go to my friends and be like, why did I do that? And <laughs> make them explain to me why I did something. Mm -hmm. Is that a theme that you find often with um, people who struggle with these issues? No, I think you were probably a little bit more evolved to be able to do that. Because I think for most people with issues of narcissism, it's why did they do that? Why did they make me do that? 
I, okay. they, provo they provoked me to do that. If you didn't say that, I wouldn't hey, have sir. done this. If you didn't just, you know, roll your eyes, Wendy, or look out the window or sigh, I wouldn't have gotten upset. And I say, okay, so that's on me, right? That's on me. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I do that a little bit right? still. But... So, yeah, it's it's sort of shifting the reasoning to the other as opposed, yeah. and, and again, it, it's all roads lead back to this just incredible insecurity and this feeling of shame. It's not stupidity. I mean. God knows most narcissistic people, and I don't say this to fill your supply, but most narcissistic people are, really, are, are very smart and you're smart, you're articulate, right? Most narcissistic people are very bright and articulate. So I often say with honesty, you're too smart for that. Give me a break. You know the difference between doing something that works and doing something that's going to hurt somebody or doing something that's careless or thoughtless or disrespectful. It has nothing to do with your intelligence. It has everything to do with your emotional state. Something got triggered in you and boom, you know, you reacted, you flip into that mode. Interesting. Okay. I like that. Do you, Rant, I just, I'm just going off these questions. Damn. Um, do you find it? How do I put it? I, I imagine like there's that whole mantra that I definitely have of, you know, the world's cruel, people are out for themselves, everyone's selfish, blah, 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 all narcissists have. Um, how long would you say a mindset like that? How long do you think that, because I still struggle with that sometimes. How long do you, how do you reframe that to other to narcissists being like, no, not everybody is not out to get you, but only looking after themselves, I guess you could say. I wouldn't reframe it too fast. I would st instead start with the question, which is, you know, what is it like for you as you tell that to me? What goes, what's going on for you as you say that to me? What comes up in your mind? What thoughts, what feelings that are personal to you that make you come to this kind of grand conclusion about the world? Something oh, that has taught you that. <laughs> That looks really good. Holy shit. <laughs> God well, damn. Because, because the narcissists are very good at, you know, these great grand statements and gestures. But, you know, very often there's a really personal message inside of that. You know, like life taught me, or this is what my dad would say, or, you know, in my world, this is what I learned. And that's what I want to know about, you know, I mean kind of some of these things are predictable these big gestures about you know the world sucks and people are all out to get you and you know everybody's in it for themselves and don't trust people who are nice to you they just want something from you so you know these are classic phrases and it's not paranoia it's it's lessons that have been learned through life it's messages that have been embedded from significant people so i want to get to the personal material the raw material because that's where we can make a difference Fuck, that was really good. <laughs> My um, I because I was just reminded of I was watching this interview with Frank Yeomans, and he was talking about how um he was basically going through that whole thing with somebody who's narcissistic, being like basically being like, yeah, and I was out to get you and stuff like that. And the narcissist uh did something that I thought was hilarious and very relatable, where he was like, I I get you now. I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to make me uh think that people are good. You're the crazy one, not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which is not an unusual line. So let's imagine if you were my client and you said that to me, you know, because I've had that, you know, oh, you just want me. So you're trying to convince me that people are good. That's your mission. And I might say, well, actually, my mission is to really know you better and to know what it was like living in your world and how you generate, you know, how you what it is that really speaks to you about that phrase that the world is filled with evil, you know, because I would agree with you to some degree, you know, that there are people in the world who are very hurtful and dangerous and, you know, do harm. And, but I wouldn't agree that that's like the fabric of life. I'm just curious about what it's like to be you and how it speaks to you. I can talk to you about how it speaks to me if you want to hear it. But I think since this is your time, I'd be curious about knowing how it speaks to you. So, and I might even empathize with, of course you would think I'm just trying to, you know, transform your thinking into everyone is good because you think that's what therapists do. So I can appreciate why you might be suspicious about my motives, but here's the thing that wouldn't be helpful to you. 
and that wouldn't tell me a damn thing about who you are. And that's what I want to know. And you, yeah, you obviously have a lot of experience with narcissistic patients, that's for sure. God damn. I do. I, I do. Um, but I, listen, I can still make mistakes. I can still certainly get triggered. And I think that for any therapist who's watching this interview and listening and thinking, oh my God, you know, well, she just knows how to do it because she's done it for so long. We can all get triggered from time to time. Anyone can get triggered. And, you know, because we have memories. So we're always at the mercy of our memory. And when we do, it's it's all right to be a human and just say, I'm triggered. Like, I need a minute. Give me a minute. Let me just figure this out. Something important is happening between us. Let's figure out what just happened. So you take a pause, you reflect, you catch your breath, and you make sense out of it, right? Yeah. And that's really the lesson is it, the too often we rush to fill the silence and we rush to defend ourselves and we go into our coping modes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, here's another one that here's another thing. This one I'm really interested in because this was for a long time. This was an issue. I would literally debate my therapist with my therapist about this, about the idea of people having inherent worth just from like existing. Because I, I remember literally saying to my therapist, you know, I'm like fucking, I have my leg up on my knee and I'm having this pretentious ass pose be, as saying something, why does somebody have worth through the misfortune of being born, you know, super dramatic and shit um, and saying that that's insane. Um, uh, how do you deal with that sort of mindset? Mm. Oh, so in other words, it's the question about you have to earn your worth. You have to prove yeah. your worth. Yeah. People are worthless until they do something to prove it. Prove that they are. Yeah, and I guess I would say, you know, it's not so much, a, yes, we all do end up in our lives needing to do something to like generate a living, to support ourselves, to support someone else if we're not, you know, and either through actions, deeds, it doesn't have to be necessarily just a paycheck, but, you know, that we're all contributing to some degree and that gives us a sense of meaning and purpose and value. But there's nothing that a child or a baby needs to do to prove themselves lovable. It's not about worth, it's about lovability and acceptance. You know, that's just a, a helpless little vulnerable life that comes into the world that needs and has the right to be loved and cared for and nurtured. Because that's, that's what humans need. All humans need that, no matter where you're born on the planet. I, honestly, yeah, that's a... Uh... Because that's the thing that actually like made me stop and be like, okay, wait, maybe uh, maybe I'm a little bit misled. There is like bring up a child as opposed to like. So I had like people in normal conversations, but like, oh, like what about a homeless man who's like super nice? I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but when my therapist brought up like a child and stuff like that, I was like, yeah. fuck. <laughs> well, it's kind of like when I look at a narcissistic client and I say, you know, it's not your. I admire your intelligence. I admire your wittiness. I admire your achievements. You have so much to be proud of because you've done so well and you're, you're in many ways very gifted. And that's something to be proud of, but that's not what makes you lovable. That's not what makes you a person that someone really wants to be around unless they really do want something from you. Um, it's, it's you being a human. You know, a human with a heart, a human who wants to connect, a human who wants to reciprocally exchange information, enthusiasm, share feelings. That's what makes someone likable, acceptable, and lovable. Not all these things you do out there, which are admirable. And that usually stops them in their tracks because they're constantly telling me things like, you know, constantly trying to sort of win my favor. And when I point that out, they get angry with me. Like, I don't have to prove anything. I know I'm fine. Well, if you really knew, knew you were fine, you wouldn't feel like you have to prove yourself so much. I'm going to venture to say, you don't know that you're fine. Yeah. Still trying to prove that. And it's never quite good enough because you've got that inner melody going all the time. Like, try harder, do more, be funnier, be smarter, be prettier, be something, right? <laughs> yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. um, shit. I, it, it's funny because, uh, a little bit off topic, but we'll, I guess not really off topic. 
what would you say is when somebody's going through treatment is kind of the first thing that they kind of realize might be wrong with them in quotes because even as a kid well maybe not as a kid as a teenager i remember the first thing that really stuck out to me was well my lack of empathy a little bit i didn't really worry i was just i'm just less sometimes a lot of people there's emotional but uh i remember talking to one of my friends being like i don't remember how it got brought up i was just like wow i'm lonely all the time and he's like you have more friends than anybody i know mm. and i was like yeah but i'm lonely all the time <laughs> yeah. and that was probably the first thing that like actually i can grapple grapple onto and be like oh that's my first time actually really noticing a symptom and what would you say is the first one that other uh narcissists generally notice I, first i wish i wish my clients could get in touch with that one more quickly because it's the one that's so deeply buried you know the loneliness even the shame so deeply buried and so much in denial it takes work you know more than a scratch of the surface to get to that but it is so um important to get to that loneliness i'll hear things that in the beginning like well not perfect or um you know oh well i do maybe i do have a short fuse or you know i need a lot of stimulation in my life so i don't have a lot of patience or tolerance for small talk and boring shit. you know that's what i'll hear and that's about as far as it goes in the beginning until we, you know, we excavate, we dig a little deeper and we do find loneliness and we do find shame and we do find this exhaustion from always having to meet these high demands and expectations. And, you know, that's the beginning of the work. That's the real work, right? Oh, I, see, it's funny, like, because some of those other things it was harder for me to come to terms with than with the loneliness honestly well i mean the shame was like a big one i, yeah. I miss my alexa by me <laughs> I, I hate the knowing the shame <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> no you don't <laughs> I mean, and i'm still working on it too i was driving well, that's today. the thing like, it does it requires a lot of work <laughs> i was literally on the road today i thought oh my god hate and disgust are different emotions <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll have, I, it's fun nowadays. It's like, oh, I discover a new emotion. That's neat. <laughs> yeah. You know um, a lot about the field. So I have only a few minutes left, Jacob, but I wanted to know, how did, how did you come to become so, um, I don't know, so exposed and experienced in this world of psychology and personality disorders? I well, mean, opposed from your own, apart from your own, you know, self journey. Um. So yeah, for, I mean, because like, I am, I guess I did start digging into it before I even started this, but well, at first it was because I would say that uh, my resentment towards my sister, because mm. I kind of had to understand borderline personality disorder. Okay. I had to understand she only had a conduct disorder when it yeah. started, but yeah. she, um, I, I had to dig deep into it. I did find it interesting, and as I kept digging, I, I, I kind of fell off it for a while until I entered therapy again and was formally diagnosed. But then I was like. It, it just fine. things finally made sense why I did feel like I couldn't connect to people, why I was always, because I always rationalized it being like, well, everyone does what I do. I just do it better, basically. Everybody works for the same reasons I do. But they just aren't aware. They're not, ironically, they're not as self-aware as I am. And um, But you didn't study psychology formally. No. No. Mm -hmm. I'm completely self-taught, <laughs> which does surprise people sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, but... It, it becomes obvious when you go into um, other parts of psychology that I know like literally nothing about. Mm -hmm. But eventually it did just kind of go into, I want to understand myself. I want to know why I've been miserable for so long. Mm -hmm. Why I have all these problems I can't seem to grapple with and can't quite seem to understand. And again, understand my own motivations because that's always been, been a big one. Like usually I would rationalize it later, but that's the thing a lot of times. I would have no idea why I did something and so I'd make up shit <laughs> to, so that I could tell people. And um, that so you're, you know, you're, you're sad. that, you're that, I think your platform and your, you know, putting yourself out there and exposing your own experiences and your own learning, your own path has got to be very helpful to those who never get the benefit of being able to unravel this with a partner who's now you know in the rear view mirror or someone who's still in their life that they just can't seem to pry open can't get them to go to therapy you know i think it's helpful to be able to hear from the other side 
you know, what's yeah. really cooking in there. And I know you can't speak for everyone who has the, has these issues because they're, they vary from person to person, but you, know, you certainly can say a lot. You certainly can, can do a lot, you know, to represent what it's like to be on the other side of this, you know, yeah. both, both from an intention point of view and your own personal suffering point of view to the struggle with change, to, the commitment to change to the suspicion about change to all of it you know i think yeah. it's i think it's uh i think it's pretty unique sure as hell it's but um, <laughs> it's <laughs> interesting um because i would also say on the other side of it um a big because i started my channel for attention and venting i'm not well, i never lie about that but it did start to change when like the first big one was this woman who was a longtime viewer of mine and like she was not around as much anymore, which I think is healthy, right? It, like you shouldn't be fixating on narcissism the rest of your life. But she detailed to me how she wrote a comment like thanking me because she was like, I never under like she went no contact with her mother because all of these sites are saying, oh, narcissists are evil, master manipulators, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And like she ended up dying. And she was like really confused about it because she never seemed like this master manipulator. And that my view of this is just a constant drive for self-esteem regulation uh, made so much more sense and help her come to terms with it. And that was like the first time I realized, like it hit me that like this was affecting people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, that's an emotion I can't deal with right now. It, especially since everything feels fake. So even when I'm trying to help somebody intentionally, it just feels like there's no genuineness about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing and, that I say that sometimes creates a little bit of a stir from those who read my book and listen to me, because I do speak from a different, a different voice box than what you hear in popular culture. Sure. It's slightly different, and that can be refreshing to some and annoying to others, but it's still what I, it's my, it's my truth, it's my experience, right? And I do think that um, everyone has a responsibility. So, yes. you know, the, the person with the issues of narcissism has a responsibility and the one who has gone voiceless has a responsibility to dig in there and find their voice again, become an advocate for themselves, make choices. And even if the choice is to stay, make sure it's a choice, you know, not just a default. So, you know, I think we all have responsibility in that regard. Amen. But I'm going to wish you the best with your program and thank you for the interview. Thanks for sitting with me. I appreciate it. It was it was very exciting and enjoyable. Thank you. For me. And I wish you the best. I wish you the very best in your work. You too. You need it too. You're treating us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Take good care. Oh, let me do my little outro. <clears throat> it's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, thank you everybody for watching. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and take your fucking meds. I love, 